الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون لا راد لأمره والله غالب على أمره ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون وأشهد أن سيدنا وعزيز نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا وقرة عيوننا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسل على فترة من الرسل وقلة من العلم وضلالة في الناس من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له أما بعد Dear committed Muslims, brothers and sisters <coughs> In the previous khutbah, we spoke about a class of clergymen. And it seems like there may have been some questions and some concerns among well-meaning individuals. We're not speaking about individuals who have diseased hearts. There's no access to trying to correct them when they pick and choose what they want to understand. So I think this khutbah is needed for further clarification of the previous khutbah. And because the weather is cold, it's a challenge to try to condense this explanation, but with Allah's help and with His guidance, we'll try to do our best. The Muslims of the world, and this is a fact, the Muslims of the world, in their overwhelming majority, have been influenced by people who have power and wealth. Governments, militaries, establishments, corporations, capitalists, etc. have left their influence in our societies. One of those influence is and this is the one that we're concerned with because there's many areas to this. But one of the most important issues that comes from the interaction between weak Muslims, physically weak, materialistically weak, militarily weak, 
economically weak, etc. The influence that has lived inside of our societies and ourselves came from those who subjected us to their institutions, to their militaries, to their invasions, to their colonization. And one of the aspects of that is just like Western Judeo-Christian societies and cultures and histories, they have their clergymen. We also began to have our clergymen. Islamic knowledge is not the monopoly of a certain segment of society. Islamic knowledge belongs to all Muslims. And those who have the knowledge have the responsibility that comes with it to dissipate that knowledge. They cannot hold on to it to themselves they have to make that knowledge public as much as they can and in doing so they cannot become a sort of independent or isolationist or elitist segment of society that's not permissible Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the ayat in the Quran says إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّاهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْكِتَابِ أُولَئِكَ يَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّاعِنُونَ What is this ayah saying? This ayah is ayah number 159 in Surah Al-Baqarah. <clears throat> Those who withhold or conceal إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَى What they do is they withhold or they hide what we, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made available of evidence and guidance. This is the area that we're concerned with. When we speak about, when, when the English word is clergyman, that has been translated into the Arabic language as Rijal ad-Din. And it probably has other translations in other languages used by Muslims. I'm not familiar with other cultures and with other histories so whoever is listening to this and they belong to their own culture and their own history take this into account <clears throat> the rajul deen or rijal deen clergymen is not a quranic word it is not a word used by the prophet and these are the two references we go back to so what do we have if we can rid ourselves of this type of inferiority acquisition, we acquired this when we were inferior. And it's about time for us to break out of that inferiority complex. So what do we have? We have ulama. We have scholars. We don't have clergymen. We have scholars. This is a Qur'anic term, it is a prophetic term. So Allah is saying, those who have this, they gained knowledge, and then they conceal this knowledge. It has to do with evidence from Allah, and it has to do with guidance from Allah. 
مِن بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّاهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْكِتَابِ After we've made this very clear to people in Scripture, what is Allah, how does Allah speak about these types of people? أُولَٰئِكَ يَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّاعِنُونَ these are the types that Allah will condemn and people will also condemn. There's another ayah in the Quran. This one is ayah number 187 in Surah Al-Imran. It says, لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَكْتُمُونَ Allah has taken a pledge from those who were vouchsafed scripture aforetime, people of the book. This is the word that's being used, i.e. al-Yahud and the Nasara, that you will certainly make this revelation that comes to you clear to people, and you don't conceal it. Now, we have among ourselves, we Muslims, and I'm not looking at any particular culture or any particular society. I'm looking at two billion Muslims in the world. We have among us people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given knowledge. And I'm not speaking about quote unquote scientific. We're not speaking about chemistry, algebra, geometry, this type of quote unquote hard knowledge or scientific knowledge we're not scientific meaning in the laboratory knowledge we're not speaking about that so what are we speaking about we're speaking about people who have knowledge that is related to revelation to scripture to prophets and to God almighty himself that's the knowledge we're speaking about What is the Prophet of Allah, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his. What does he say in just uh, two or three hadiths of his? Inna mathal al-ulama You see, the equivalent of ulama or the similitude of ulama as in view of Allah, kamathal al-nujumi fi sama They are just like stars in the heavens. يُهْتَدَى بِهَا فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحَرِ You find direction by looking at these stars when you are in the darkness on land or sea. فَإِذَا طُمِسَتْ النُّجُومِ أَوْشَكَ أَنْ تَضِلَّ الْهُدَى If these stars in the skies, if they were eclipsed, then those who are trying to find their way will go astray. So important it is when we're speaking about people who gain knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> In another hadith from the Prophet of Allah, إِنَّ الْعَالِمَ لَيَسْتَغْفِرُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ A scholar has those who are in the heavens and on earth asking for forgiveness for him. <coughs> Even the whales in the oceans. And the exceptionalism of a scholar over a worshipper, so to speak, is that of the moon over the rest of the planets. And then he says, Inna al-ulama'a warathatu al-anbiya. Scholars are the heirs of the prophet, of the prophets. Okay. 
the word alim and the word ulama, alim in the singular, ulama in the plural, is a Quranic and is a prophetic word. Innama, in the Quran, innama yakhsha allaha min ibadihi al ulama. Those who stand in awe of Allah from among all his subjects are al ulama, the scholars. So, and when in this hadith, the last one that was just quoted, the Prophet says, Al ulama warathatul anbiya. These scholars, they are the inheritors or the heirs, H E I R S, of the Prophets. What was the function of the Prophets? Let's take this to another level. When you think about prophets, there are prophets, all of us as Muslims know, we're familiar with these prophets, from Adam and Idris and Nuh, all the way to Yahya, Zakaria, Yahya, Isa and Muhammad, and everyone in between. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. Were they a class? Ask yourself, were they a class of people? Did they distinguish themselves as a class? When you read about them in the Quran, does it occur to you that they were forming a class of people when they wanted to guide their own relatives, their own communities, their own folks? Were they a class of people? Or they were just one of them? You can detect this when every prophet says, Ya qawmi, my people. And such is the case with the ulama. Now, in some areas of the Muslim world, where this distinction of people, meaning people with knowledge, become a class, There's nothing wrong with people of knowledge being specified by their specialty of knowledge. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with saying a certain person is a faqih because his area of studies and research and ijtihad is in the area of fiqh. There's nothing wrong with another scholar being called a mutakallim because his area of study was logic, philosophy, etc. But there's something wrong when they part from society when the knowledge they have causes them to in a discriminatory manner causes them to break away from society then we have something wrong here the prophet of Allah may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his at one At one time in his life, he had a person come up to him. And that person heard that this is the Prophet of Allah. And he sort of felt like he's dealing with some high class personality. And the Prophet says to him, Calm down. I'm only an individual whose mother used to eat dried meat. That's what he said to the person. who He detected in him that this person felt that, and he's Allah's prophet, 
You can say he is the uppermost of the ulama in this area of revealed knowledge. So what are, when we say ulama, what are we talking about? We're talking about we want to get out of the clergyman description. And we want to gain the alim description. So what is it? What makes a alim different from a clergyman? A clergyman belongs to a clergy class. A alim does not belong to a class. He belongs to the people. At the beginning of our history, we had a type of schizophrenia that set in, whereby we had rulers and we had scholars. That's schizophrenic. The scholar should be the ruler and the ruler should be the scholar. There's no differentiation between the two which unfortunately we live with today. Why can't we have those who have the Islamic, Quranic, prophetic knowledge, why can't we have them part of average society? They melt in like everyone else. This is necessary for a proper give and take of communication. Because the average person who doesn't have much knowledge, he will, normally speaking, he will act in a certain way. He will not be his own self when he realizes in his mind that he is speaking to a person belonging to another class of people. This destroys the amalgamation within Muslim society. It shouldn't be there. I don't want to be specific because I don't want to get on people's nerves. And I try this as much as possible in the khutbas. Even though I get sometimes criticized, I don't know. I'm trying my best. Allah is my witness. When Muslim scholars, when they gain power, this could be in the local level, and this could be at a much higher level. Why are they still perceived in the public mind that is still influenced by the materialistic West? Why do they still perceive of them as clergymen? Muslims locally or internationally, Muslim scholars, when they gain positions of influence, they still are perceived, this shouldn't be, but this is the fact of life. They are still perceived as clergymen, not as ulama. This is one of our problems. We have this as a problem. And we have to surmount this. <clears throat> so what, what do we expect from ulama to do? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam said, Man ra'a sultanan ja'iran, whoever sees a person in authority who is an oppressor or a violator of justice, mustahillan li haramillah, whatever Allah has made unpermissible. This person in power makes permissible. Nakithan li ahdillah. He backs away from his pledge with Allah. Mukhalifan li sunnati rasulillah. He is in contradiction of the Prophet's pattern. 
يعمل في عباد الله بالإثم. He operates, he functions among the subjects of Allah with a criminal output of decisions, policies, politics, whatever. يعمل في عباد الله بالإثم والعدوان. And then, you know, they have military power, then there's aggression that they show. فَلَمْ يُغَيِّرْ And no one is changing this. فَلَمْ يُغَيِّرْ بِقَوْلٍ وَلَا فِعْلٍ Of course, this is expected by people who have the knowledge of this. You can't expect anyone to do something when they are vacant in their minds, when they don't have knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. But if you have knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, and when you have cumulative knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, that is, you are a alim, and you don't try to change that ifim and that udwan with any of your speeches or your statements or your sermons or your khutbas wala fa'lin by what you do by your programs there is programs around people have programs in their masajid in their islamic centers in their conventions in their conferences are they working on trying to check that deviation at the decision making level فَلَمْ يُغَيِّرْ بِقَوْلٍ وَلَا فِعْلٍ كَانَ حَقًّا عَلَى اللَّهِ أَنْ يُدْخِلَهُ مَدْخَلَةٍ It becomes due upon Allah to have that person go his way. And what is inferred here is go his way to punishment and to the fire. This is, this is the character of the ulama. Not a class of people, just like we have a commercial class in society. Are we supposed to have a commercial class? Entrepreneurs, capitalists, that's another area. That's another fragmentation of society that is not permissible in an Islamic environment, in an Islamic community, in an Islamic way of life. That is not permitted. We, we have multiple problems. We don't have problem of clergymen being a class. We also have a problem of rulers being a class. We also have a problem of rich people being a class. All of this has to dissipate and disappear if we are to resume our Islamic responsibilities and our Islamic direction. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ودعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله تواب رحيم الحمد لله الذي هدى صلى الله وسلم على سيدنا المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه أولي النهى والتقى Dear committed brothers and dear committed sisters This past week and right now we are trying to live up to our responsibility as being people who have some knowledge as being an individual who has some knowledge This past week there has been a type of invasion of locusts and crickets and grasshoppers in Mecca, in the millions. This is something that is unusual. And this has caused, of course, it has caused many individuals to comment on why is this happening now and these this is winter time in mecca this is winter time so why do we have millions of locusts and grasshoppers and crickets and whatever other types of insects 
invading the haram and the haram area and all of this in Mecca. There's an ayah in the Quran that says, this, this ayah in the Quran, 133 in Surah Al-A'raf, it is speaking about what happened when the Pharaoh of Egypt was in contradiction to Allah and the Prophet of Allah. You can say the rulers of Arabia are in contradiction to Allah and the Prophet of Allah on a scale competing with the Pharaoh. So the ayah says, فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمُ الطُّوفَانِ وَالْجَرَادَ وَالْقُمَّلَ وَالضَّفَادِعَ وَالدَّمَ آيَاتٍ مُفَصَّلَاتٍ فَاسْتَكْبَرُوا وَكَانُوا قَوْمًا مُجْرِمِينَ We sent against them, meaning Pharaoh and his power pompous position, floods and locusts and lice and frogs and blood exquisite demonstrations of Allah's power and authority فاستكبروا they showed arrogance وكانوا قوما مجرمين and they were a people of crimes they were criminal people how apt is this description to those who are making decisions for their societies and because Mecca and Al Medina is there, they are making decisions that impact the rest of the Muslims in the world. Surah Yunus, Ayah 92. There are many people who are oblivious to our, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking, to our demonstrations of power and authority. We don't have all of the details available to us, but the obvious crimes and misdemeanors of the Saudi regime if they are not going to solicit a human correction, they will solicit a divine correction to them. They're not going to get away with their crimes. Crimes against their own people. Crimes against their fellow Arabs. Crimes against their brother Muslims. Crimes against oppressed people around the globe. They have their wealth. They have their politics involved in these crimes. And the ulama of the Muslims should be speaking out without hesitation against these crimes on multiple levels in many areas committed by the rulers in the Arabian Peninsula. First and foremost among them, of course, are the ones who rule over Mecca and Al Medina. An ex-U.S. ambassador who used to be the U.S. ambassador in Saudi Arabia during George Bush's administration, he said that the U.S. government's position towards the assassination of Khashoggi is a joke, was ridiculous. Not a Muslim, this is not a Muslim speaking, it's just a person who has common sense who can express himself, something that Muslims themselves lack. Look at Muslims, do they have the freedom to express themselves? Do you detect in them the common sense that comes with every human being? We're very short on that. One of the scholars in Saudi Arabia, and I'll call him a clergyman, one of the scholars there, his name is Awad al-Qarni, they say right now he's been in detention for many, many months and his health is deteriorating 
to the extent that some fear he's going to die in detention. Has there be, are there any Muslim voices? Especially, we expect these to come from people with knowledge who are spotlighting this type of official behavior against an Islamic scholar. Then we have news there's going to be an economic summit that's going to be held in Beirut, I guess in about nine or ten days. And the Saudi king says he's not going to attend. Well, good riddance. And we wish that there were others like him who say that they don't want to attend. And then we have this issue of a young Saudi Arabian lady, 18 years old, who fled her kingdom, went to Thailand, and then the Saudis want her back. We don't know if she's been coached on how to deal with this legally, but she's cer certainly making the right decisions in as far as asking for asylum. Why would Saudi women, this one in Thailand, months ago there was another one in the Philippines, I guess it was, and then there was another one a short while ago in Holland, in Europe, and these are the ones that are reported in the mainstream media. Why are women trying to flee the land of Allah and His Prophet? You ask yourself, why is this happening? Some reports said, well, her parents are angry with her because she cut her hair. They tell us this is where they want to take advantage of the ignorance that is promoted in our masajid every Friday. They say her parents are ultra-conservative and they are so upset with their daughter, why did she cut her hair? And she was also disturbed by her parents opposing her cutting her own hair, so she wants to flee. And she left. She flew out of that kingdom and then she's asking for asylum. How is she doing this? She says she renounces her Islamic faith. Imagine a person wants to live their conscience, have to renounce their Islamic faith. And she knows if she wants not to return to her own country, to her own family, she has to renounce her faith to gain the freedom to be herself. Now this is not encouraging vice. Don't understand what I'm saying as promoting some type of wayward lifestyle. I'm not uh, here to discuss cutting hair or here to discuss how much should be covered of the face or of the head and these other issues that have become the main issues in Islamic khutbas, in Islamic programs and in the meantime, the enemies of Allah and His Prophet are killing us. And we are arguing about how much hair should be cut and how much not. Which leads us to these types of events now that are circulating all over the place. Said the BBC, when this happened, this happened in the past week, it began its news items, the leading news item was this about this Saudi 18 year old who wants to leave her country forever and now we're saying we're, we're being told some uh, media leakage that Saudi Arabia is going to reopen its embassy in Damascus we've been living the last seven and eight years and we listened to the officials of the Saudi regime and what they had to say to their enemies and to their friends. Now we ask the same enemies and the same friends that they were speaking to, what do you have to say now? And obviously, if knowledge is lacking, and it is lacking, unfortunately, 
I don't say this with ease. When knowledge is lacking, all of this happens in front of our own eyes with no critical thought about what is happening. Because that's the way we're supposed to be. You're supposed to be dumbed down, on, especially on Fridays, especially during the khutbah time. And then we have the warming up of relations between the fanatics in Arabia and the fanatics in Israel. I don't want to say the fanatics in Palestine because some people will think I'm speaking about Palestinians. I'm not speaking about Palestinians. I'm speaking about Israelis and Zionists. And I'm speaking over there in the Arabian Peninsula about these Wahhabis and these Salafis. The, the head of the Israeli Labor Party clandestinely visited Abu Dhabi. He went to the United Arab Emirates away from the cameras, away from the public eye. Why? You're doing something uh, uncomfortable? You're uncomfortable with what you're doing? Like crooks and thieves. They operate or they set their policies in motion clandestinely. Now, Gulf Air, another institution in the Gulf, is going to resume flights to Damascus. When we hear, when we see, when we are privy to this type of information, we can't help but extend our hand to those who have been deceived and fooled by these criminals who hide behind Islamic imagery. They killed hundreds of thousands of us in the past seven years. And you know which countries I'm talking about. And then there are officials and representatives from Arab countries who are going to Israel. The countries are Jordan, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. Some of them represent parties, some of them represent NGOs, some of them represent governments. Why are they trekking to the enemy of Allah and the enemy of the Muslims and the enemy of oppressed people all over the world? Why are you going there? If there was enough consciousness in us, we the Muslims, we would not tolerate these officials entering the masajid. And if they do, they should know that they're going to be speaking to an enlightened Islamic public. The head of the Palestinian Authority, Mr. Abbas, this is what ulama should be saying, shouldn't be, the ulama themselves should not be hiding, and the ulama themselves should not be silent. Mr. Abbas spent one-third of last year outside of Palestine. Enough care for his own people, would you say? And now the Israeli, the Israeli colonizers of the Holy Land, they are asking governments in Arab countries to pay them $250 billion reparations for what they say are 849,000 Jews that left their original Arab country. Well, who told them to leave? There were Jews in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Yemen, and Iraq, in among other areas. They went to Palestine. We, the Muslims, or the Arabs in these countries, we didn't tell the Jews, go to Palestine. 
And now, they take this whole issue and they come down on us. Where are they going to get this money from? $250 billion. Where are they going to get this money from? It is from our budgets. The budgets don't belong to criminal rulers. They belong to us. Uh, but we're not supposed to, you know. Oh, the Jews, they had possessions in Damascus and in Cairo and in Ribat and Fas, etc., etc. And they were confiscated. They no longer have that. So we want you to pay us. Enough humiliation. How much humiliation are we going to tolerate? And to add insult to injury, I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, I took a little more time in this cold weather. We have in Algeria some religious institutions there, no doubt influenced by the criminals in the Arabian Peninsula, and they want to make a divisive issue out of this, telling the Berbers, the Amazigh, you can't celebrate your new year. It happens their calendar on their calendar the 12th of Jan the 11th or 12th of January is their new year and they're told this is a bidha this is, this is this is how this is how they want us to begin to have friction and division and quarrels and then fights and wars among ourselves they don't want us to speak about this now we're going to speak about it because we are expected to speak about it as per Allah's ayat and his prophet's instructions. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna tiba'ah wa arina al-batila batilan warzuqna ijtinaabah wa la taj'alhu multabisan alayna wa ij'alna lilmuttaqina imama ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وآل محمد وصل وسلم وبارك على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة